دکتر هیلسون راجع به شکار قوی سیاه یا مدیریت ریسک بلک سوان هانتینگ ریسک منیجمنت میخوان صحبت بکنن I would like to ask you to proceed and give your speech in Thank 30 minutes very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning. Still just good morning. Salam. I appreciate your patience and I stand between you and lunch. So I know that uh, you will be keen to, uh, for me to get on with the things that I have to share. But first of all, I want to uh, thank the conference organizers, Dr. Sabia and the Scientific and Technical Committee uh, for inviting me to this conference. I have wanted to come to Iran for many years um, and it's not been possible. And then in October of last year, um, I wrote uh, when the situations began to change. And I wrote to my coll colleagues and contacts here and I said, does this give us an opportunity And immediately I had a response uh, from a colleague, uh, Dr. Hossein Nurzad, who is not able to be here today. He has a, a family issue to, to deal with. But uh, Dr. Hossein immediately responded positively and arranged an invitation for me to be here. Uh, and I'm very pleased to have my first opportunity to be here in Iran. It's been too long before I was here. I'd also like to recognize my colleague, Mr. Razul Abdul Mahamadi, who is here in the front. Uh, who has been translating my work into Farsi, into Persian, for 10 years. And uh, all of the results of his good work are freely available on the Risk Doctor website uh, if you'd like to read some of my work and also his work uh, in your own language. I appreciate you allowing me to speak English, and um, I give respect and honor to our interpreters who make it possible for me to share some of my ideas and also for their service to me in allowing me to share in the other presentations. Uh, I very much enjoyed yesterday and this morning and learned some really interesting things from the other speakers. And so I appreciate the, the work of the interpreters uh, to make that possible. And again, congratulations on putting together a really powerful uh, and well-constructed program, which I'm enjoying. So I am the risk doctor. All I know about is risk and risk management. Uh, and yesterday I had the privilege of presenting a short workshop uh, where we talked about the practicalities of managing risk in projects and specifically how to identify individual risks and then to respond appropriately. Today I want to complement, to add to that talk uh, from yesterday by talking about another type of risk, not the individual risks within our projects, but the things which emerge and surprise us, the emergent or unknown risks. And I'd like to suggest some things which might be useful to you at an individual level, at a project level, and maybe even at a national level. So my talk is called Black Swan hunting. And I'm going to explain later why I'm talking about strange birds called black swans. This may be a surprise for you. But let me start by asking this question. We know that the future is uncertain, both at the national and the global level, but also in our organizations and our projects. And I wonder how that makes you feel. If you feel nervous and worried by the uncertain future. If it gives you a strange feeling here that it's not very pleasant, I wish it was not this way. Because uncertain means dangerous. Some bad thing is out there in the future waiting to get you. And so what we have to do if this is our view of the future is to be very, very careful. And a lot of us take that view about the uncertain future, whether it be for our personal lives and our families, or whether it's for our projects or our careers, or for our society and our national ambitions. We have to proceed carefully. And some of the earlier speeches, particularly yesterday morning, the opening session 
and Dr. Sabia's presentation first thing this morning talked about some of those challenges which we face at the national level and advised us that in some areas we need to be careful. But there is another view of the future, the future which is uncertain. And maybe you feel like this about the uncertainty, that the uncertainty is exciting, that the uncertainty is interesting, that uncertainty offers us a challenge. If we can ride the uncertainty and harness it and use it to create value. With this view, uncertainty is not dangerous, uncertainty is challenging and the right response is not to be careful and protect ourselves and retreat the right response is to be brave and to engage and to advance which of these two views is right they're both right there are some future uncertainties which we need to be careful about and there are also other future uncertainties which we need to engage with and be excited by. And so we need to take this double response when we're thinking about the uncertain future, whether it's at national level, at project level, or at personal level. Maybe we think that the future is dangerous and there are a number of reasons we might think that. And I like to use this word danger to introduce six different aspects of the future which we need to think about when we're considering our response. The future is not static. The future is dynamic. It's changing constantly. There is a lot of volatility. We see it immediately in the foreign exchange markets. We see it in the, stocks, uh, the stock markets of the world. We see it in politics and technology. There is constant dynamism and change. The future is also difficult to understand. It's ambiguous. We're not quite sure how things are going to develop in the future. The future is non-linear. We cannot predict what will happen in the future by looking at what happened in the past and projecting. It is not a straight line anymore. Things are changing in unpredictable ways and we have to be able to respond to that. Here is a word that might challenge our interpreters. It's the word glocal. Glocal is a combination of global and local. And what it means is that the things that are happening in the wider world globally affect us locally. The world is much more connected than it used to be. But also the actions that we take at local level have wider consequences. And we need these two perspectives to come together. The other thing about the future which makes it interesting and uncertain is that it is emergent. That there are things arriving which we didn't expect. Things which become visible which previously were hidden. And we have to have a way of understanding those and responding to them. And finally, the world is relational. It's about people and connections between people. The future is much more to do with our communities and with our partnerships, as we've seen this morning, than about us as individuals or as families or as businesses or as nations. There's much more connectedness for us to consider. Now, in the short time that's available to me this morning, I can only talk about a, short, a small portion of this, uh, of this landscape. But I want to talk about emergent risks, risks that arrive when we weren't expecting them. What can we do to deal with emergent risks? First, we should define what we mean by the term. Emergent risks are things that arrive on the scene that we weren't expecting and that we weren't prepared for, that we had not predicted. They are big. They are things that have very extreme impacts. They might be very, very bad, or they might be very, very good, but we hadn't seen them coming. And the interesting thing about our psychology is that when these things happen, we look back at them and we say, of course, that's obvious, we should have seen it, but we didn't, 
they appear to be obvious afterwards. These emergent risks have other names. Sometimes they're called unknowable unknowns. Not unknown unknowns, the things that we don't know that we don't know, but things that we could never know. They are unknowable. They emerge from the fog of the future and surprise everybody. They have a, a technical name, which you need not try to translate, ontological uncertainty, but commonly they're known as black swans. Why are they called black swans? You have swans here in Iran, we have them in my home country, in England, and we knew as an absolute certainty until 1790 that all swans are white. It's a known fact. And so you see a big bird with a long neck and big wings, it lives on the lake and it flies around. It's a swan. Then we discovered Australia. And we went to Australia in uh, the 1700s and we found this big black bird, had a big body and a long neck and a big wings, and it looked just like a swan. But it can't be a swan because it's black. How can this be? And so the scientists developed a separate family for this one bird, all on its own, because it looks like a swan, but it can't be because it's black. And uh, then we discovered we had to change our view. We had discovered something new about the world, that some swans are black as well as white. This term has become used for emergent risk, for things that we could not foresee until they arrived. And there is a book called The Black Swan. I have a copy here in, in the Persian language, in Farsi, which has been translated by Ariana Group, uh, one of the conference uh, sponsors. And this book uh, explains the whole concept. It was written about 10 years ago by a Lebanese uh, thinker and philosopher and economist. Um, and this book is available on the bookstore downstairs. They asked me to, to mention this. So I'm, I'm not selling my books, I'm selling their books this morning. So, black swans. Uh, could I give you some examples? I can't give you examples of black swans to come because, of course, we cannot see them. They are emergent and unknowable. But we could categorize them as these kinds of things. Inventions which change everything. Or technologies which cross from one field to another and make a complete difference. Or things we might say that are game changers. We could look back and see some examples. So we might think of the invention of the internet. Unforeseeable until it happened. Everything changed. In the late 80s was the fall of communism. It was known in the West that there are two systems that will last forever, capitalism and communism, and the two are in competition. Well, no longer, and maybe capitalism will not last forever either. In the late 90s and the early 2000s, we had the rise of Google. Now we can find out anything at the touch of a button on your phone, and the rise of social media through Twitter and other similar platforms. Of course, the great financial crisis uh, of seven or eight years ago in 2008 changed everything, and the old certainties are no longer certain. And the thing that is affecting us today, and you particularly as an oil producing country, has been the recent change in the price of oil from over 100 to below 30. Who could have foreseen such a thing? And how long will it continue? So we have examples from the past these things that arrived on the world scene and changed everything. How can we manage the things that might happen in the future? If risk is uncertainty, we have to remember, and this I shared with uh, the people in the workshop yesterday, not all uncertainties are risks. Not all black swans do we need to worry about. We only need to worry about the uncertainties that matter, that could affect our objectives. And we learn certain things from this principle that risk is uncertainty that matters. We can define risk. Uh, there's an ISO standard, ISO 31000, which connects risk with the things that matter, with our objectives. It says that risk is 
the effect of uncertainty on objectives. And so if we're thinking about looking for emergent risks, first we need to know our objectives at personal level, at project level, and at national level. But there's something else that the ISO standard tells us about a definition of risk. It says that risk is the effect of uncertainty on objectives, but that includes positive or negative effects. So something else that we learned in our workshop yesterday is that there are good risks as well as bad risks. And this applies to these emergent black swans. Some of them are not pleasant. Maybe the price of oil is a bad thing. Some of them are very good things, like the internet or the rise of Google. So we have two types of black swans to be thinking about, bad ones and good ones. But how do we get ready for these things? Risk management is part of the answer. Risk management offers us a forward-looking radar that scans the future and says, what is out there? What is coming towards me that has not arrived yet? What bad things are on their way to me? And can I see them with enough time to respond? What good things might happen on the horizon that I could steer towards and take advantage of. It offers us early warning of the things that are coming to us from the future. But how can risk management help us with black swans if they are unknowable? We cannot know them until they arrive. If they are unknowable, they must be unmanageable, right? Maybe. Maybe the event itself might be unmanageable, but we could look for the things that cause black swans. And we could prepare for the common effects of black swans, so that whatever they are, we're ready for something that might affect us. How could we do that? Well, what are the common causes of emergent risk? I want to just mention here a study from the International Risk Governance Council. And a little while ago, they issued a really excellent report called um, Emerging Risks, the Common Causes. And they identified 12 factors. I've made the slides from my presentation available. And on, on the back of the slides, I've also provided a copy of the executive summary from this report, so you can read more about these factors in more detail. But these are the things that give rise to emergent risks or black swans. I won't spend time looking at all of them, but we might pick a few. We might pick things which are completely unknown at the moment. So, for example, Ebola or Zika virus, or things that we had not thought about at all and suddenly they arrived on the scene and we had to deal with them in certain countries. Uh, we might think about the increased pace of change or the increased connectedness between different um, elements within the, the society that we work in. We might think about new technology, things that are arising that we've never seen before, which could change the game completely. And so there's a number of different things which we could scan for, which we could look into the future and say, are any of these things likely to affect my objectives, my personal my project or our shared objectives in the nation. And then if we see things coming, we can prepare for them. How can we prepare? We can prepare by knowing where our vulnerabilities are, which are the things within us, within our projects, within our organizations, or in our wider, wider society that are vulnerable, looking out for emergent risks that are on their way, and monitoring those early warning indicators using the risk management approach and then building resilience. And I want to spend my last five minutes just talking about resilience at four levels. Resilience personally, resilience in projects, resilience in business, and resilience in wider society. So what is resilience? Resilience is defined physically in, in physics or in engineering or mechanics as the capability to get back to the shape you had first if something comes in and squashes you out of shape. 
So you can squeeze a, a, a tennis ball. When you let go, it becomes a ball again. If you take a piece of mud or a piece of clay and you squeeze it and you let go, it stays squeezed. It doesn't have resilience in its shape. There's a use of resilience for organizations or for individuals which says, whatever hits me and takes me off course, if I can regain, maintain my core purpose and regain effectiveness in the face of changed circumstances, then I am resilient. Or we might call it this word, bounce back ability. Whatever happens, I will bounce back and continue. If I fall down, I stand up and I keep going. So that's a, a defini definition of resilience that we could think about. But how does that work in terms of individuals, projects, and nations? We're not talking about changing the future. We can't change the future. The future comes to us. We can't control this, this quote. We can't control the tides of change. But we could build better boats. And here we have the prophet Noah's uh, example for us. So, how do we build resilience? First of all, for us as individuals, it's important for us, facing an uncertain future, to know how I must respond. This is because I am working on my project, I am part of my family, I am part of my society. If individuals are not resilient, then we can't build resilience at the higher levels. So a resilient individual, personal resilience, comes partly from who you are. Some people are, are tough people and some people are not so strong. There's partly a, a, a built-in personality issue. But there's also the ability to practice what we call emotional literacy, or you may call it emotional intelligence. So that understanding of myself, self-awareness, and the ability to modify myself. If I find myself adopting a position which is unhelpful, can I monitor my own position, my own attitudes, my own feelings, and then change them if necessary? This is a, a, a development of personal maturity. And then there's a, the just straight exercise of will. I will not be beaten by this change. I will get up and continue. I am not going to lose and be a quitter. So there are things that we can do personally to develop resilience. At the organizational level, it helps if the organization has a shared culture, the values that we all share together and we all buy into. And it helps if the organization has good, solid processes, which won't be driven off track by change. And also if the business has values which are grounded in integrity and in realism and in maturity and reality. At the national level, there are some interesting things that build resilience in a society. The first is a strong sense of shared identity. I am English. I was talking to somebody yesterday and this person commented on some of the things I do and the way I do them. I was a little embarrassed. Um, she, this person was being very, uh, very complimentary. In the end, I said, look, I'm just an English gentleman. That's just how we are. And we have shared values. We are polite. We respect tradition. We are tolerant. We believe in fairness. These are just our values of the society. And because I am English, this is how I am. Of course, there is a very strong Persian identity. There is a strong national identity that you share. Because we are both old cultures. Yours is, of course, much, much older than mine. Um, but there's a sense of who we are, and that brings strength and resilience to a nation. We have shared values. And we have uh, the other thing which is important, which uh, ha has been raised in other presentations, is this idea of coherence at different levels. So all levels of society share the same values and express them through their behavior and their decisions. So I think that's interesting. This is a project management conference, so we should think about project resilience particularly. And how do we develop resilience in our projects in the face of unknowable risks that will arise out of the blue, out of the fog of the future? The first is to know clearly what we're aiming at, 
what are the objectives of our project so we have a clear target in mind. I'm heading here, something takes me off track, I'm, I'm heading here. And then this takes me another way and I'm still heading here, I know what my objectives are. If we don't have a clear view of where we're aiming and we're taken off track, we could end up somewhere else. Building contingency into our project planning in terms of finance, in terms of time, in terms of resourcing, in terms of technical capability is really helpful. Having processes which are flexible, not bureaucratic, you have to sign here, go through this gate, attend this meeting, issue this report. But if something happens, we can flex the process. Uh, having a strong change management capability is obviously important if things come to us that we weren't expecting and frequent reviews to make sure that we're responding to the current situation as we find it. And finally, a team that is empowered to do what is necessary to achieve the goals, instead of always having to ask permission. So I think there are a number of components of resilience which we could think about which will help us to deal with emergent risks that come to us from the future. And uh, we, we heard yesterday morning from uh, Dr. Nili about how we might create opportunities as a nation from this post-sanctions world that we're facing. He actually pointed out some comparisons with other nations who had responded well or maybe not so well to these similar major changes in their national environment. But I think we can take this to heart for ourselves as individuals. We can learn to be resilient personally, we can learn to make our projects resilient within organ organizations which are also resilient and help to build a resilient society so that whatever comes at us, we're ready for it, we can stay on track and maintain our core purpose. So let me just, in closing, talk about three tactics, three things you can use to develop resilience at each of these levels. The first is your mindset, the way that you think about the future, the way that you think about uncertainty. Expect black swans. Expect emergent risks to come that you weren't ready for. Be ready for the things that you're not ready for. Be ready for something, because surely something will happen. And improve your scanning of the future. Secondly, minimize the effect of the things that do come through effective risk management. As we scan things closer to home, closer to our personal objectives or to our projects, or our organizations, and we see things emerging from the fog that become real risks, then we can manage those effectively to keep us on track. And finally, if something does happen that we weren't expecting, maximize the value. Learn from the things that came which, which we weren't expecting, and learn to make sure that we don't have similar surprises in the future. So, these are the things that we can use. Emergent risk is important. Who's going to do this? Well, it depends which risks emerge. For some risks, they will need to be dealt with at government level or at the level of the leaders of our societies. Some emergent risks will affect our businesses and some will affect our projects. It's important that emergent risk is managed at the level at which it arrives. And that means that everybody needs to take responsibility for managing risks that emerge in our environment, in our area of authority. And to do that in a consistent and coherent way. This means you. This means me as well. We each have responsibility for scanning our environment, being aware of our objectives, and responding to the things that come along proactively so that we maintain our core purpose. So finally, Emergent risk requires everyone to pull in the same direction. Emergent risk can be managed proactively, even though it's unknowable. We can manage it in advance by developing resilience. In our projects, it's our responsibility to do that. We are accountable for delivering the value and the benefits and the outcomes of our projects. But we do this within a wider context, within the context of business, strategy and the national context. It is possible 
to see black swans before they arrive. They are coming. We need to do something about them before they get here. So let me close by wishing you happy hunting for your black swans, to see them, to kill them, to actually get them out of the way and make sure that we can maintain our path to achieving our goals. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll let you go to lunch. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hilson, for presenting a very interesting uh, issue of risk, which is uh, facing all the environment it's my and the resilience. Thank you so much.